Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Last time we left off after a mission of the slightly different kind. With only three soldiers, we had to clear out an alien supply train, and, well, our Reaper Dragonova absolutely came to play and made that mission look easy. Today we are jumping back in right after the completion of that mission, and for the next few days I think we will continue scanning at the Skirmisher HQ, as we are currently in the process of constructing the Resistance Comms facility, and getting that up quickly does have its benefits. Right away then we are informed about another rumor that we could scan, but it's only supplies, and at the moment I believe we have enough of those, and the monthly supply drop is also coming up shortly, so we'll skip this for now and instead head over to the skirmishers. Avenger plotting new course. Alright, quick pause in the action as the rehab slot in our infirmary has just opened up again. We have successfully removed the Fear of the Chosen trade from Bartosz Smoo B, and we will now finally get to do the same with Twitchy, which is important, as I believe a Chosen will show up on one of the next two missions. So, 10 days for her, and we can keep scanning. The Resistance Radio Research Project should be up next, but who knows what the aliens have in store for us in the meantime. continue to make progress on the Avatar project. If we're going to slow them down, we'll need to move fast. All right, so the Avatar project is ticking along, but... Our inspiration did prove beneficial. There we are, Resistance Radio has been completed, and this is actually a very important milestone. You can see it right here, it says that radio relays have now become available, and with a bit of strategic placement, those will drastically reduce our need to collect intel. Now we'll dive into how exactly they work in just a second. There is one other thing though that this project has unlocked for us, as we are now actually also able to see continent bonuses. Yes, those make a return in XCOM 2 as well, but this time they are randomized, so seeing what we're actually dealing with and what we might want to prioritize is very useful. Again though, we'll take a look at those in just a second. For now, let's take care of the Advent Trooper autopsy, because apparently we have now killed enough troopers so that the project is now completed instantly. Knowing that my past surgical experience is limited, I am sure the crew appreciates that I hone my skills on fallen Advent forces before triaging our own wounded. To the uninitiated, the common Advent Trooper is seemingly human. The aliens have disguised this most glaring divergence from the human form with a carefully designed helmet. Despite a thorough analysis, I have yet to discover what, if any, advantage the Advent Hybrid Soldier's enormous eyes provide. Testing their visual acuity will no doubt prove difficult. Okay, a bit more plot background regarding the troopers, but arguably even more importantly, we have just unlocked the battle scanner. And for those of you who followed along with our first XCOM series, this device should be familiar, although with the presence of Reapers and concealment, it is no longer as crucial. Still, we won't be able to take a Reaper on every mission, and concealment is also not always active, so having access to a device that helps us scout out the battlefield is definitely useful. Now, the choice regarding what to research next is a fairly straightforward one. All of the available autopsies here will eventually become instant with enough corpses collected, and I would argue that none of them unlock anything that we absolutely need right this second. So the choice is once again between offense and defense, and while plated armor would finally give us tier 2 armors for everyone in our squad, let us first finish giving tier 2 weapons to everyone, as Gauss Weapons unlocks the magnetic weapon upgrades for the Grenadier's Cannon, the Sharpshooter's Sniper Rifle, and the Reaper's Vector Rifle. I will make that our highest priority. Still, with only one scientist employed, this will take some time, 23 days to be exact, so we will likely be able to make quite a bit more progress on the world map before the project is done. Commander, we can now construct radio relays in any region where we've made contact with the local resistance. And speaking of the world map, as you can see, we now have insight into the continent bonuses, and I'm actually pausing the recording here to take a closer look at these, as the timer in the lower right corner will keep ticking on, and the next supply drop is only one day away. Now, first of all, we unlock these continent bonuses by making contact with all regions assigned to a continent. In the case of Europe here, that would be only two, and we have made contact with both, indicated by the two green bars. 
In addition to that, however, we also need to install at least one radio relay in Europe, which is indicated by a small circle to the right of that bar. And it doesn't matter where we place it, it just needs to go in one of the two European regions. Now, the required number of regions and relays varies per continent, with Europe and South America actually being the easiest. And with that out of the way, let's briefly talk about the five individual bonuses. Again, these are randomized, and they're also chosen from a much longer list, so in another game we could end up with five entirely different ones. Now let's get to it, in Europe we have the chance to unlock mental fortitude, which means that stuff like panic and other negative states of mind will only ever last one single turn. I would say this is moderately useful, especially since XCOM 2 introduces quite a few more of these states and not just panic like in the first game, and with only one more relay needed to grab it, I think we'll get some use out of it. Moving on then, we have North America with live fire training, and on paper this sounds incredibly powerful. If we unlock this and train up a rookie in the Guerrilla Tactics School, they will immediately be promoted to Sergeant instead of Squaddy, so basically we receive an additional rank for free. However, with three regions and two relays needed to unlock it, I think by the time we manage to actually grab this, we will have a well-developed roster of much higher ranking soldiers, so I would say this is really only powerful in the earlier stages of a playthrough. In South America then we have Volunteer Army, which I think is a very interesting one, because on every mission there will be the chance of a random resistance soldier joining us for the duration of that mission. As far as I know, they are generated randomly and will not join our ranks permanently. Still, every little bit that helps us tip the action economy in our favor helps, and this is very much one such thing. In Asia then, we have Munitions Experts, and this is once again very useful. I don't want to dive too deeply into the mechanics behind it, because we haven't unlocked the Proving Grounds yet, but suffice it to say that the instant completion of experimental ammo projects inside of the Proving Ground will drastically change how we use that facility. Finally then, we have our home continent of Africa with another moderately useful one. Rapid collection makes it so that our monthly supply drops are collected instantly, which is definitely helpful as it will save us 3 days per month, but it's also not a complete game changer in my opinion. So, those are the 5 continent bonuses we will attempt to unlock and we will begin with Europe right away, and not necessarily for the bonus itself, but primarily to reduce the intel costs for making contact with West Asia and East Africa. As you know, the further we move away from our base in West Africa, the higher intel costs for making contact with new regions become, while a radio relay basically acts as a new base for the purposes of intel cost calculations. For example, with this constructed, the cost of making contact with West Asia will be reduced from 240 to only 80 units of intel. In addition, we will also receive 100 extra monthly supplies from the region we built this in, in this case Eastern Europe, and since the first radio relay only costs us 50 supplies to construct, this is an easy choice. Setting course for Eastern European Ward. Incoming message for you, Commander. Patching it through to your quarters now. I had high hopes for the resistance under your leadership, Commander, and you have outdone yourself. So, the Council once again seems to be very happy with us, and in just a second we will be able to collect our monthly funds of roughly 300 supplies. My training, my focus, all of my efforts have been rewarded. I am reinvigorated. Of course, the Chosen have not been sitting idly by and unfortunately the Assassin here has gained melee immunity, which now severely reduces the usefulness of Rangers, Templars and Skirmishers in taking her down. Still, it's not the worst strength to gain, so I think we'll find a way to work around it. You're beginning to slip. <laughs> Your plans are no longer as unpredictable as you may have thought. The risks are ever increasing. And while the Hunter remains unchanged and keeps training, the Assassin has actually reached the knowledge level of Sentinel, which means that all of our covert actions now have higher risks associated with them. This is bad, but part of the natural progression of the game. Still, in the future we might have to be a bit more selective about which covert action we pick. Up next then we receive the list of dark events that might go into effect soon, and on the left here we have alloy padding, which if I'm not mistaken is a 50% chance for any humanoid type advent trooper to receive one point of armor, which is mildly annoying on the weaker units, as one point of armor is really not that big of a deal, but can become increasingly troublesome on those advent troops that already have armor on their own, some of which might actually start showing up soon. 
So definitely worth keeping an eye on, but so is the Alien Infiltrator Dark Event, although in comparison I think this is less impactful. All it does is add faceless to those missions where we can encounter civilians, but the appearance of civilians is restricted to particular mission types, so this will very likely not affect every mission, and with it lasting only one month I think we might be able to live with this. Finally then, let's spend the 30 intel here to reveal the hidden event, I think we have enough at the moment, and this gives us signal jamming, which I think is the one that we absolutely need to counter. What it does is for 6 weeks it doubles all the scanning times, and that actually includes stuff like making contact with new regions. So this is definitely bad and has the potential to waste a ton of time, time that considering the current process of the Avatar project we might not have. So I think this is priority number 1, 30 intel very well spent, let us now move on to resistance orders, where I think we'll keep things the same for one more month. I had hoped to actually have the skirmisher slot unlocked by now, but the recent chosen sabotage unfortunately delayed that. Still, with the advent alloy padding dark event likely going into effect soon, we might want to switch things over to weak points soon. For this month though, I think we'll stick to vulture and scavengers. The supply drop meanwhile will have to wait just a little while longer, I think we want to get this radio relay built as soon as possible. After all, I think it's time that we finally start taking out some advent facilities. The aliens are still moving forward on the Avatar project. Taking out that facility would deal a serious blow to their efforts. Although we have allies scattered in cities throughout the globe who are willing to share their knowledge of Advent's operations, the aliens are actively pursuing them. It will be up to you to ensure the safety of our operatives, Commander. Good luck. Okay, so the Avatar project is ticking along and we have our next mission, and the reward here actually couldn't be better. Another scientist is something that we desperately need and the intel is a lovely bonus on top of that. Worst case scenario, we use it to purchase something useful from the black market. So let's dive into Operation Haunting Sky, a VIP extraction mission, hopefully without the hunter making things more complicated. Setting course for Sector 11, West Africa. Alright, and this is going to be our squad for today, a bit of melee damage, just in case the hunter shows up, and since VIP extraction missions usually don't start us off in concealment, we also bring our Reaper Dragonova along. Before we get going then, we can also quickly slap a conditioning PCS on Specialist Schwaminian. This gives him one extra hit point, and I think having a healer who himself has good survivability, that is a useful thing to have and allows him to focus on others. And there we go, let's get to it, let's extract ourselves a VIP scientist. Sky Ranger deployed. Menace, ready to deploy. We're moving in for an emergency extraction of a VIP working for the Resistance. The spokesman provided the coordinates, but the rest is up to us. Locate the VIP and escort them out of the area safely. Goes without saying, but don't leave any hostiles standing. Menace 1-5, target coordinates incoming. Secure the VIP and proceed to the evac volume for extraction. Advent already knows we're here, so your position isn't concealed for the extraction. And here we are, with VIP John Draco Quistadal right in our middle, and with our extraction zone a bit further up ahead and on the high ground. We have 12 turns to get there, but Advent already knows that we're here, so we likely won't be able to start things off with the usual Overwatch ambush. And while we have a minute here, let's actually also quickly read through the biography of John Draco Quistadal, who was submitted by Patreon supporter Draco. Born in the late 90s, John is old enough to remember the horrors of the initial invasion. He wanted to fight, but the quick surrender of nations left him no option to do so. Like the rest of the world, he tried to make a living in the New World Order, but found it hard to adapt. Possessed of a strong anti-authoritarian streak, he was unable to watch in silence as the Advent administration spread their propaganda and totalitarian rule. Speaking his mind would end up costing him his job and academic career. Having lost everything, John wanted to end it all, but he was saved by his future wife. He found a new reason to live when he became a father, and he swore to dedicate his life to protecting his children. When the call from XCOM came, John had to make the hardest choice of his life, leaving his two little girls to fight for their future. 
Absolutely lovely backstory here by Draco, thank you so so much. The background in academia actually fits perfectly for a scientist, so let's make sure that we get John out of here alive. And the first step in doing so is to scout ahead with our Reaper, who secures the high ground and immediately spots the first enemy patrol. You will never hide from me. I've spotted an alien patrol. Stun Lancer, Trooper and Sectoid, definitely something that we do not want to rush into blindly, so the rest of the squad will move up onto the roof as well, but stay back a bit. Thanks to Dragonova, we know where our enemies can and cannot see us. John, meanwhile, stays on the ground and hunkers down and that's our turn. And as you can see, our enemies actually move away from us. So on our next turn, we will have Dragonova follow them and also catch sight of our left side here. That seems clear though, so let's continue to move up as far as we can without risking detection. I hope it's worth it. Getting it done. We then end our turn on Overwatch, as I'm not exactly sure where the patrol is going. Maybe we can already catch them by surprise. The Alright, lovely, looks like Shrominian is the first to spot the Sectoid and immediately delivers 8 points of damage. And that is followed by a reaction shot from Starfall Antec and that also connects, and so we now have one Sectoid less to deal with. Conveniently enough then, in their search for cover, both enemies actually drop down, and so that should make things easy, especially so if our ranger can one-shot the stun lancer here. And as always, Starfall Antec delivers with a critical hit, leaving only the trooper. I got it, right? And with the high ground, we can actually negate the half cover, so let's see what Grenadier Nicholas can do from above. And there we go, that's the first enemy group already defeated, nice and easy. Rock and roll. Now we need to make sure that we don't spread our forces too thinly. I'm going. So let's keep moving up here, the timer is ticking along after all. But to end our turn we can take at least a small peek ahead with our Reaper. I am trusting you. That does not reveal anything though, so let's end our turn. And with no further hostiles showing themselves on the alien turn, it's time to move again. Between us and the extraction zone, we have this street canyon thingy here, and dropping down there could be risky, as we are basically surrounded from all sides with high ground. As you order, Commander. The time for hiding is over. I've spotted an alien patrol. However, that might be an advantage we can also use against our enemies, of which we have now found the next three, a mech, a priest and a purifier. Quite a bit of health on these three, and for now the priest also vanishes back into the shadows, but the split second they were there were enough to identify them, at least in editing. Now, with the group barely at the edge of Dragonova's sight radius, we won't engage just yet. Instead, we can pull up our forces, bring everyone back together, and then go on overwatch, in the hopes that our enemies come just close enough. You cannot run. Menace 1 5, be advised. Hostile interceptors are inbound on your current position. Firebrand has a limited window to provide extraction. Okay, brief warning from Central here that one third of the timer has expired, but I think we are on track, and thankfully it also seems like the Hunter is not active on this one. So let's set things up here, and maybe we can even manage to remain unseen for a little while longer, because as you can see, Dragonova can just barely hit both the Priest and the Mech with her Claymore. Placing explosive. Unfortunately though, it turns out that she can't actually shoot it, which is definitely a bit disappointing. Although it looks like we can salvage this with Nicholas, who can actually blow it up without getting himself spotted. And there we go, that is some lovely damage and some very important armor shredding on the mech. The priest unfortunately has used his sustainability to remain alive, but I don't think that's going to help them much, especially since our entire squad is technically still hidden, so why not go on overwatch here and let the enemies do a bit more work for us. All 
right, and there we go, the grazing shot from Starfall is enough to kill the priest, I definitely got that one. while neither mech nor purifier draw any other reaction fire, but in their current state they shouldn't be too difficult to deal with. And once again our grenadier gets the first shot here, with the mech standing barely below the bottom of the stairs, we technically do have height advantage, and that boosts Nicholas's hit chance to a lovely 89%. And that's enough for the kill, as well as for the promotion to sergeant, which is actually one of the things that I wanted to achieve with him here today. I'm going. Following that up will then be Schwaminian, who from the high ground here has a guaranteed kill on the purifier. There you go. And there we go, another enemy group lies dead and with 7 turns to go the extraction zone comes closer. Now however it looks like we have to start crossing that gorge, so let's have Dragonova scout ahead. The rest of the squad meanwhile will remain on top for just a little while longer and then we go on overwatch to end our turn. Oh yeah. My turn on so far so good, no new enemies in sight, we do have an advent watchtower on the left side though, so let's move up with Schwaminian here, we have to do that anyway, and see what we could get for hacking it. Accessing system. Alright, so a 43% chance that we alert any nearby enemy groups to our position. I think we can actually live with that, so I would assume that there is only one more group left, and especially considering that the hack reward is intel, we absolutely want to go for it. Now in editing I realized that with the downside being comparatively harmless, we probably should have went for the large intel cache. Instead though, as you can see, we are going with the safer option, the small intel cache, which I believe is 20 units. And that succeeds and also shuts down the tower, which now would be a good way to move across without having to drop down, although it is admittedly also a bit of a detour considering where the extraction zone is located. So let's keep pushing through the street canal and hopefully make it back up on the other side safely. Back in. Watching Alright, still nothing and we have 5 turns left to go, so chances are that next and potentially last group of enemies is hiding out somewhere inside of the building. You can never escape my sight down there, patrol. And indeed here they are, Muton, Stunlancer and Purifier. Once again a good amount of health, but nothing that we can't deal with if we play our cards right. Now as you can see, Nicholas can actually hit them with a grenade from down here and we'll keep that in mind for our next turn. After all, we are not really in a rush, so let's slowly move forward, but not attract attention just yet. Okay, so the enemy group is walking away from us, which means that we can actually move up a bit further, and in the hopes that they come back towards us on the next turn, we are now setting everything up for an overwatch ambush. And there we go, that didn't take long, let's see what we can hit here. Interceptors are on high speed approach. Your window for extraction is closing. So, three turns are left and we haven't really done any damage, and our enemies have also spread themselves quite far apart, so taking them all out could get interesting. So, let's start things off with the Muton, which we can strip off some of its armor with a grenade from Nicholas here, which conveniently enough also Jack. removes a wall and gives us slightly better line of sight against the purifier. Following that up, we are then moving in with our ranger Starfall. Keep in mind that we do not want to engage mutons in melee. The axe throw, however, is perfectly viable. Unfortunately though, the 84% misses and that makes things a bit more complicated. Still, we'll stick to the plan, but first we'll move up Shumin in here, and then we hope and pray that Starfall does not miss this one. All 
right, lovely. Critical hit for the kill, that is what I had hoped for. It has to be dead. And not only that, he also receives the promotion to lieutenant, and with that actually becomes our first lieutenant rank soldier. This now also puts us back on track for the rest of our plan, so let's get Dragonova up onto the high ground here, where she can land a guaranteed shot against the purifier through the glass. And keeping in mind that purifiers tend to explode upon death, we don't want to engage this one in melee either, so instead Templar Logan will repeat after our Reaper. With that, he now gets the promotion to Corporal, and that leaves only the Stun Lancer. And while we do have a 73% hit chance with Shromin in here, we would need to roll for max damage to get the kill. All in all, a bit too risky, so let's just go with the Frost Bomb instead. And with three turns still on the clock, we can then actually also extract our VIP and complete the first objective. And I also don't think that we'll run into another group here, so the rest of the mission should be smooth sailing. So next turn, and if you're wondering about the Muton Corps disappearing here, my game actually crashed at the end of the enemy turn, and reloading the exit save tends to do some weird stuff to enemy corpses. Either way, Starfall recovers an Illyrium Core and an Alien Data Cache. The latter can actually be used in research to recover intel, so on the intel front this mission is an absolute blessing. If you say so. Starfall can then also already get himself into position for the evac on the next turn, while Nicholas launches a frag grenade against the Stun Lancer. After all, it would be a shame if we easily manage to kill everyone and then run out of time for the evac. Grenade out! And with the first bit of damage done, Schwuminian can now move in for the kill. And there we go, that should have been the last enemy of the mission, and that means we can spend the rest of the turn getting out of here. First with the Reaper Dragonova, and then with Templar Logan. And with the clock ticking on the very last turn here, it looks like we'll finish this one just in time. So Ranger Starfall Antec is up next. Then Grenadier Nicholas. And finally, thanks to moving up just a few tiles on the previous turn, Specialist Schwaminian can make it into the evac zone just in time as well. Packing it in. Status confirmed. Mission accomplished. And there we go, a flawless mission has been completed, we have extracted a valuable VIP scientist. Thanks to the scouting capabilities of our Reaper, this one actually felt fairly manageable at all times. So let's snap a quick mission photo here and then get back to the base. Advent officials announced an increase to this month's recruitment quotas. Citizens are encouraged to voluntarily visit their nearest recruitment center. Remember, only together can we build a better tomorrow. As long as there's even one Reaper left standing, you can bet they're still in the fight finger on the trigger. And there we are, as you can see we have three promotions that we need to take care of, starting with Lieutenant Starfall Antec. With him we have the choice between being able to enter concealment once permission, or the ability to take an action after dashing with run and gun. Now concealment would actually synergize very well with his shadow strike ability, however it can also only be used once permission and is therefore probably best reserved for scouting, and for that we are actually building up Ranger Helleborus, not to mention the obvious choice Reaper Dragonova. So the more offensive minded run and gun it is, which can be used an unlimited amount of times, although it does come with a 3 turn cooldown. Up next then we have Grenadier Nicholas, and just like with Twitchy a while ago, we are going with Suppression here. In my opinion, Demolition is really not useful at all, especially since it's not even guaranteed to destroy cover, which is basically its only use. 
Finally then, we have Templar Logan, and once again we have three skills to look at here, starting with parry, which is, spoiler alert, the one we'll take, because attacking with his melee rend is something that Logan does quite often, and being able to soak up all damage from the next attack afterwards basically takes out one enemy for the turn, and with enemies getting more and more powerful, that is actually pretty useful. One alternative would be Aftershock, which is basically holo-targeting, but for his Chain Lightning Vault ability. Not bad in theory, but I feel like the Templar doesn't really use Vault all too often, and so far his main strength is definitely melee combat. The final ability would then be Amplify, which allows him to mark a target for a 33% damage increase for all subsequent attacks on that turn. However, with this being a percentage-based bonus, I feel like it's becoming increasingly more useful the more damage we actually put out, as boosting a minimum 6 damage to a potential 8 is not really going to be a game-changer. Still, it might be worth looking at later in the game, keep in mind that we can actually buy all of these if we want to. For now though, we'll grab Parry and then move on. Here we are then, with our recovered loot and intel, as well as with a full view of our VIP John Quistadal, who, despite looking more than ready for combat, will now actually join our science team, and to be honest, that is where he will most likely have the biggest impact anyway. You and your crew have dealt another serious blow to the aliens' efforts today, Commander. Impressive work. And there we are, another reminder that alongside our scientist John we have also recovered 95 intel, which is basically one free region as soon as that radio relay has been built. Our research is progressing as expected, Commander. In the research labs we can then also see the progress bar on Gauss weapons is down to only 16 days, it was 22 before the mission, so it looks like Draco Quistadol is already doing some good work. I think we should also be getting close to the point where the sectoid autopsy becomes instant, but for now it looks like we don't have enough corpses just yet. And so, let's keep scanning, because I actually want to finish this video with a couple of questions for you guys. First of all though, we are informed about another resistance rumor that we could investigate, and this one is once again an absolutely lucky roll, because yes, with just 4 days of scanning we could grab ourselves yet another scientist. And I think we'll definitely do that, but let's finish that radio relay first. That is probably just about as important. Setting course for Sector 6, Eastern Europe. We can also see on the left here that the Stun Lancer Dark Event has actually already worn off, so we survived that one without it actually ever bothering us. Now, at this point I want to pose my first question, because as you can see, rookie Bryn Graham has been promoted to specialist in the Guerrilla Tactics School. And if we take a look at the facility now, you can see that we cannot train any more rookies, because we have indeed run out of people to use. Yes, we have trained them all up, and my question at this point would be, should we hire more? On one hand, that would allow more Patreon supporters to make their way into the series. On the other, hiring rookies costs money, although not a lot, and with so many trained up soldiers already in our roster, it's not really guaranteed that they will ever see any action. So this would be question 1, let me hear what you think about it as we keep scanning for a little while longer, and now actually finish the construction of the Resistance Comms facility. Resistance Communications facility now operational. Now with the Rebel Radio achievement unlocked, we can take a closer look around the facility, and immediately you can see it in the top right corner, we finally have room to add one more region to our contacts. The facility also offers room to staff one engineer, who would then add two more contacts, and we could increase that number even further with an upgrade here to staff a second engineer, so in total the facility could give us five additional region contacts. For now though, we need just the one, so let's use that free engineer to help clear alien debris, that should help us get to our next facility a little bit quicker. At this point then we can head back to the map with the second question, which would be, which region do we actually want to make contact with? With the next one we definitely want to reduce the Avatar project progress, but we actually have two options. Number one would be to make contact with West Asia, the home of an Advent Black site. This is a plot mission that we will need to tackle at some point if we want to progress the game's main storyline, and clearing out the Black site would not only reduce Avatar project progress, but also reward us with a few supplies. The other option would be East Africa, where we have an alien facility. Clearing that would also reduce Avatar project progress, and the choice is very much up to us which one to attack first. I am personally leaning a bit more towards the black side, just because it's a plot mission, but let me know if I'm maybe overlooking something here that speaks in favor of the alien facility. Against the elders, we find nothing but success. 
And indeed, there we are, the covert action to hunt the hunter is complete. So after the assassin, we have now taken the first step towards pushing back against this chosen as well. It also looks like everyone made it out unscathed, I'm actually not quite sure if there was a risk of injury. Either way, our resistance ring is now ready for the next covert operation. Looks like we've got some new information on the Chosen after our last covert up. And yes indeed, as a result of this covert action, we have now also increased our influence with the Skirmisher faction, which in turn has opened up their resistance order slot, although we can sadly only use it at the beginning of the next month. And here you can see it, one additional resistance order and a long list of new covert actions, and we'll take a look at those in just a second. We are ready for more orders, Commander. We only await your choice. For now, the new resistance order, Inside Job 2, would actually once again help us collect intel, increasing all intel rewards by 15%. And that would have been incredibly useful for that previous mission, but who knows, maybe we still get some use out of it going forward if we decide to actually apply it. Our influence with the resistance factions has motivated them to share some new information on the Chosen. For now though, let us finish this episode with question number 3, and that will obviously be which covert action to take next. As you can see, we have a long list of available ones, and feel free to pause the video if you want to read through all of them. At the moment, I am leaning towards either the skirmisher covert action to reduce avatar project progress, those are always good to have, although as you can see, it is also a moderately risky one. Alternatively, the Templar Covert action to gather intel sounds intriguing, especially since the risk can be negated and it only takes 6 days to complete. Then again, with the radio relay being built, we might not actually need that much intel, and perhaps we also want to keep hunting the Chosen, which we could do for both the Reapers and the Skirmishers. Again, let me know what you think in the comments down below, and with that, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut for today. So, as always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.